but I'm certainly proud to deface everyone you buy. This probably, this probably doesn't matter to you to hear it, but it matters to me to say it. I do not take one penny for speaking at places like this, books that are sold, 19 books, hundreds of thousands of copies worldwide. I've never, there's no smoke and mirrors. I don't take one penny. I'm on a salary as the executive director of the National Institute of Christian Leadership. Everything else goes 100% to uh, support our girls' homes in West Africa and Southeast Asia. So I hope you'll go back there to the book table and spend yourself into bankruptcy. <laughs> Forget about Dave Ramsey. <laughs> Refinance your house. Spend the children's lunch money. Come on. All right. Uh, if you have your Bible with you, if you'll turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. I'd like to dive right in on some of the issues of, of healing. I'm going to begin reading at verse 7, Matthew, chapter 6. I'm not, uh, I'm not hung up on what version you read in, by the way. You don't have to have a King James Bible to go to heaven, okay? One will be given you when you get there. <laughs> but why stand in that long, embarrassing line? <laughs> I'm joking. We're going to get along better if you realize that about every fourth sentence, I, I have to amuse myself. It probably... The kids at the universities, I was the president of two different universities over the space of about 16 years, and the kids at the universities always used to ask me, President Rutland, why do you always read from the King James Bible? And I said, look, and the first reason, it's loyalty. I went to high school with King James. Um, it was Jimmy, he, we called him Jimmy, he wasn't a king in high school. The other reason is that the Shakespearean sound of the King James Bible that seems to offend everybody else appeals to my theatrical spirit. I like all the these and thous, but, but I'm not hung up on it at all. I just, once you get used to a version, it's really hard to change, isn't it? So I'm going to read from King James. You follow me in whatever cheap communist imitation you've got. <laughs> uh, you're, you're a jollier crew than I was expecting. I'm, all right, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7, Jesus is speaking, but when you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Just put your hand on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray. Padre bendito, celestial, te damos gracias por tu presencia con nosotros en esta tarde, porque te necesitamos mucho. Necesitamos un palabra de esperanza. Ayúdame, por favor, lléname con tu Espíritu Santo. Gracias por tu gracia. Gracias por tu amor precioso. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We honor and glorify your holy name and pray that you will pour out your healing grace upon us and within us. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong son of God. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. I'm a lifetime student of the discipline of communication. I've spent my life trying to figure out what, what makes communication work. When it works, why did it work? When it went south, what went wrong? 
um, in linguistics, in, in preaching, in teaching, in writing, in, in mass media, radio, television. I've tried to understand communication. I know what some of you are thinking. If he spent his whole life studying communication, seems like he'd be better at it. But you don't know how bad I might have been. <laughs> the thing is this, were one to boil the discipline of communication for a thousand years, the creme d'essence that would rise to the top is simply four things. The right message to the right party in the right way at the right time. The right message to the right party in the right way at the right time. If you get any of those variables wrong, it can go really wrong really fast. The message that you think you're transmitting may not be at all the message that's being received, and therefore it may not elicit the response that you had hoped for. Every married man in the room knows exactly what I'm talking about right now. Imagine, therefore, the constant struggle of Jesus. And before the, this brief weekend is over, I want to talk about the communication issues of Jesus. But for right now, he is teaching on the simplicity and power of prayer. And he comes to the end of it, and it is as though he says... I'm afraid you're going to miss the point. So he plucks out of the prayer, which he has just taught, the one thing that he evidently feels is at the heart of the prayer. Because he begins the bridge with four. Pray this way. For, that's a bridge word. Therefore, because, for, and he chooses the issue of forgiveness. That's not the only thing in the Lord's Prayer. The Our Father covers a wide waterfront. But when he gets finished with it, it's as though he says, the, the, the essence of the prayer is, is forgiveness. The challenge for us when it comes to the issue of forgiveness, is that it is, I, I believe, I heard Dr. Dennis Kinlaw many years ago say that he believed waiting was the most mature of all Christian disciplines. I'm loath to differ with the late, great Dennis Kinlaw. However, I believe it may be forgiveness. And I think forgiveness speaks to us, to the, to the inner wound of us at such a level that we are not infrequently unaware of, of, what, of the challenge that forgiveness is presenting to us mentally, emotionally, and ultimately physically. So... What do we even mean by forgiveness? What did, what did Jesus mean by forgiveness? It's interesting that in the first part of the Lord's Prayer, as we read it in English, we are not reading it in Aramaic, but in English, but as we read it in English, the first journey through the Lord's Prayer, he uses the issue of debt. In, the, in his own commentary, he switches to the word Trespass. So in other words, he connects the issue of someone sinning against us to the issue of their debt to us. So some years ago, I, my wife and I together were counseling with a, a pastor's wife. And their, their whole life and marriage and ministry, everything was hanging by thread. This is what had happened. They had gone through. Um, they had gone through a plane crash. In in multiple ways, emotionally, relationally, morally, years and years and years before. They had been able to find the healing mercy of God. 
been healed, restored, and had an effective and anointed ministry together. When someone on the board of the church found out about that which had happened a quarter of a century earlier and, and brought it to the surface. And in the midst of the counseling session, the wife, who was by far the angrier and more hurt of the two, because her anger was not assuaged in any way by guilt, his was. The guilt had been his. So when you're struggling with the guilt, and said, you sort of feel whatever anybody do, does to you, you deserve it. She didn't feel that. So she feels this is unfair. She's gone through it 25 years ago. Now she's going through it again. So the unfairness of it is now back on her again. So in the midst of the conversation, the counseling or whatever you want to call it. She said, I feel like we had an area of our lives dealt with, processed, healed, and locked away. And someone went in where they did not have any right to go. And in that moment, it's one of those sublime divine moments the word trespass from the Lord's Prayer just came in my mind. I said, they trespassed. She said, yes. We had put a sign out, no trespassing, and they trespassed. I said, Jesus talked about it. She said, he did? When? <laughs> because she's thinking trespass in terms of walking on a lawn that isn't yours. She wasn't in her mind making the bridge to forgive us our trespasses. So I reminded her of the Lord's Prayer. And it was one of those, how, how many pastors or counselors do we have in the room? Will you raise your hand? Then, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's one of those inexplicable moments where just like the light comes on. And, and she said, this is, this is what he was talking about. And I said, yes, but he connects it to the issue of debt. You feel those people trespassed on your past life, and now they owe you. And she said, they owe us. They owe us. And I said, yes, but you see, those words are connected. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those against whom we hold debt. She just began to weep. She just began to weep. And she said, I want that debt paid. I want the debt paid. She said, they have, they have brought misery back into our lives that we dealt with a quarter of a century ago. And they've uncorked the whole genie again. It's all out. And she said, don't you believe they owe us? I said, they owe you. She said, they trespassed. I said, they did. She said, I, I'm glad you agree with me. I said, I agree with you. Now what are we going to do about it? <laughs> I said, the issue, the issue is, yes, they did. So at that point, you face this incredible mental, emotional, and spiritual hurdle that Jesus laid before us. And he said, if we've all trespassed, Someplace where we shouldn't be. Everybody in this room thought something you shouldn't have thought, said something you shouldn't have said, gossiped on somebody's life you shouldn't have done. Everybody in here has been in territory you weren't supposed to be in. So Jesus says, if you crossed over a fence at some point that said no trespassing, don't go in there. And you did. So he said, now how are we going to deal with that? We're going to deal with that by you forgiving people that trespassed in your lives, that walked on your life in ways they weren't supposed to walk on your life. So we come to the issue then of, of forgiving others as release, to release them from the debt. So when we, we often only think of forgiveness 
in terms of kind of making the sign of the cross over somebody else's sins and say, your guilt, I, I relieve you of the guilt. But the problem is we, we hold on, often, we hold on to the issue of payment. So what if, what if you said to God, forgive me, let me come to heaven when I die. He says, I forgive you, but I want you to know you've hurt me. And you, he does let you come to heaven. And you get to heaven, but he says, you're forgiven and you can be in heaven, but don't come around me. And then at some point you come into the throne room and Jesus and St. Peter and St. Paul and a few others are in there and they're all laughing at some joke. And you walk in the door and God says, there he is. That's not heaven, that's hell. And it's not God, that's your mother-in-law. So the, so the issue is not simply, the issue of forgiveness for others is not simply marking the, the, marking the sin off the guilt blotter. It's relieving them of their indebtedness to you in any way. So what we want is some kind of emotional payment. We want to forgive and then sulk. We want some way in which I extract some pound of flesh or emotion or something. There's some way that I, that yes, I forgive you, but I, I expect to be paid somehow. And therefore, to forgive as Jesus says it is not only to forgive the sin as a sin, but to release the hope of payment. So that he connects the issue of trespass and debt. Because we all, everybody in this room is an expert at extracting emotional payment. We've all done it. From the time we were, from the time we were children, we knew how to get paid emotionally. To scream at the wrong time or cry at the wrong time or inflict guilt on somebody else. We all know how to do it. So Jesus connects that hope of payment, and that release of the guilt of the sin itself. So the pastor's wife said, so in other words, I don't have any right ever again to expect that those people who have walked on our lives are going to ever come to me and ask for forgiveness or confess or anything. I don't have any right to expect. I said, you have every right to. You have every right to. And you can claim those rights, or you can get healed. I said, you have every right to. I said, yeah. I said, every time you see one of them, you should turn your nose up or spit on them or something. And she said, well, Dr. Rutland, I don't, I don't feel like you're, I don't feel like you're, you have an, unre you have an unreasonable expectation. I said, no, I have no expectation. I'm only saying Jesus says that the key to being healed in this is release. Now, the, the problem is we are not healed all at once emotionally. The, the late, great Corey Ten Boom told a magnificent story about going to her old Lutheran pastor and saying, I think about those guards at the concentration camp. They come into my mind and I forgive them. And I, I said, Lord, I know what you're taught, and I forgive them. And then she said, down the road somewhere, it, it comes back. And, and she said, it comes up again. And I said, oh, I, I guess I didn't forgive, and again and again. That old priest was wonderful. He said, Corey, do you remember when you were a little girl and you used to come to the church early before church, and I would let you ring the bell? And she said, he said, I would let you grab the rope and pull down. And then sometimes you would even hold on to the rope and ride up. And then back down and back down until you rang the bell until the whole village knew it was church time. And he said, then finally I would say, okay, Corey, let go. That's enough. And you would let go the rope. She said, yes, I remember it. He said, here's my question. When you let go the rope, did the bell immediately stop ringing? He said, that's the way it is for forgiveness. 
we let go the rope, the bell may ring for a while, but your hand is no longer on the rope. So yes, forgiveness is a spiritual, emotional discipline of healing, but sometimes we are also more critical of ourselves than we should be. We also are in the process of being healed of unforgiveness. When I was in my late 20s, right at the end of the Civil War, I remember, <laughs> so, you know, it's really rude to laugh at a guest speaker. <laughs> I, I remember an older pastor who did something to me. I, I don't even remember what it was, something that I felt had damaged my ministry and somehow or another. And I, I couldn't get past it. I'm telling you, it just... I would pray just like Corey Ten Boom did. I would pray and forgive and forgive. And then the minute I was at some meeting or a conference or a dinner party or something, and his name would come up. <laughs> it was there again. Anybody, am I the only heathen in this house? Do you know what I'm saying? And just surface again. And so finally, one night, I had a sleeping dream. A dream, not a, a vision, a sleeping dream. And I dreamt. He was killed in a horrible, flaming car crash. And it was so graphic that it woke me up. And I said, oh, Lord, are you revealing to me that he's going to be killed in a car crash? And it came in my spirit. No, I'm revealing to you how you really feel. That deep in your heart, that's what you want. And it, it rocked my world. I fell out of bed and fell by the side of the bed and started praying. And I said, God, now listen to this. <laughs> Don't do this unless you mean it, okay? I said, God, do whatever it takes. Okay, see, that's, don't do that. <laughs> I said, God, do whatever it takes. But I've got to be healed of this. So I went to... Uh, that, that's a, an alarm telling us that there's bad weather. <laughs> I've known prophets like that. Um, <laughs> so I went to, anybody here ever heard of Indian Springs Campground in Georgia? Anybody? There's five or six, good. It's a, a big non-denominational hole in this campground in Georgia. So I went down there not to preach. I went to hear a friend of mine preach, Colonel Andy Miller. He was a Salvation Army colonel, a great preacher. And I went down there to hear Colonel Miller preach. And I was way up in the back row in the gas mask section of the thing. It's huge. And I was in the back. And so Colonel Miller got up and he said, I felt moved tonight to preach on forgiveness. And man, he lowered the guns to deck level and loaded with grape shot. And uh, just, you know, the devastation in your life if you don't forgive. And he just pounded it. I mean, it was, I'm being nice to you. He was rough. And when he got finished, he gave an altar call. I didn't want, I didn't want to do that. I'm in the back row. Walk up there, everybody's, woo, wonder who Dr. Rutland hates, you know. And, <laughs> I didn't want, I didn't want to do that, but it. It wouldn't just leave me, and I walked all the way down there. They had a, a, an unusual arrangement at that little camp meeting. The, the altars were little tables, like little wide tables, and the people coming for prayer would come on one side, and the prayer workers would come on the other side and kneel with these tables between you. And I just knelt down, and I was just saying, God, you, you've got to help me. And somebody came and knelt on the other side of the table, and reached his hand over on my hand, and he said, can, can I pray with you about forgiveness? <laughs> oh, yes, it was. <laughs> oh, yes, it was. 350 million people in this country. <laughs> I, I didn't even have to open my eyes. I recognized his voice. <laughs> he said, there's someone you just can't forgive, isn't there, son? And I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it was in that moment. I felt almost like 
the laughter of God healed me. It was over. It was finished. I never told him. He didn't, he, he didn't know it was him. He said, is there somebody you can't forgive? I said, yeah, it's a guy. <laughs> so, which, which convinces me that God wants us healed more than we want to be healed. And his grace and goodness, uh, he's not lashing us with a bullwhip of Protestant works righteousness until we, until we forgive because otherwise we go to hell. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is life trespasses on our lives. People trespass on us, and we feel deep within us, I ought to get paid. There ought to be a payoff for this trespass. I ought to be able to sue somebody. So I was counseling. This, this pastor asked me to come and counsel with a couple at his church. So we were in the study, in the pastor study, me and the pastor and this couple, and they were totally and completely estranged. They just 20 years of misery. And finally, they had agreed for counseling. And so uh, I just began the process, and the woman said, told me what the problem was. 20 years earlier, he was an over-the-road truck driver. 20 years earlier, he had spent a night with a hooker at a truck stop. 20 years ago, he had gotten saved, asked for forgiveness, pled for her forgiveness, 20 years, they have not, they've lived in the same house, they've not divorced, they've also not embraced, they've never kissed, they live as angry, hurt people in the same house for two decades. And I, I said, sister, do you, do you feel that you have forgiven him? She said, I forgave him for that years ago. I said, okay, just on the outside chance <laughs> that there's some, you know, residual thing here. Let's, let's process it a little bit. I said, I want to ask you a question. Do you, in your heart of hearts, deep within, I'm not asking how you feel, do you believe God has forgiven your husband? She said, absolutely. I know that he got saved after that, and I, I believe he's saved, and I believe he's going to heaven. And I said, let me ask you a question. Do you think there's any chance at all that that hooker ever got saved? Could that have happened, theoretically? She said, sure. I said, now, the New Testament says if we don't forgive other people, God can't forgive us. I said, wouldn't it be a tragedy if your husband and that hooker go to heaven and you go to hell for unforgiveness. There is a boldness born of being a visitor. And um, <laughs> somehow or another, it's one of those moments. It's like God hit her in the face with a hammer. She said, oh, my God. She said, what have I done? What have I done? And she turned to her husband and she said, oh, James, 20 years. She said, the best years of our lives. She said, what have I done? They embraced. The pastor was hugging them, everything. All of a sudden, the man said, oh, my God, look at my hands. He had arthritis in his hands so bad he couldn't hold a pencil. We, they never told me about his hands. We never prayed about his hands. Now, don't look. If it's at all possible, we'll get the wrong point. I'm not trying to say everybody with arthritis. So <laughs> I saw four women lean over and say, show me your hands. <laughs> no, no, that, the point is, that the human machine is so complicated, everything spiritually, physically, emotionally, all of that, all those gears turn together. You drop the monkey wrench of unforgiveness and sin down in the middle of that, and it just, it just goes haywire. 
By the same token, you drop healing, forgiveness, and grace down into that, and it can all start to be healed. We never even prayed about his hands. I, wasn't, I didn't know about his hands. He wasn't seeking healing for his hands. And it was spontaneous, and he was healed in that moment by, by the healing power of forgiveness. In fact, they were both healed. They were both healed. It's a tragedy when we have to waste decades of our lives in hurt and unforgiveness and bitterness, looking, looking for the payment, looking for the, for the payoff. What do, I, what do I get to get back out of this? So how do we, how do we respond to this? The easy thing is to just say, all right, if anybody is sinned against you, then forgive them. But there are still questions people ask. What if the thing that was done to me was unforgivable? It's one thing. One thing for a husband to sin against his wife with immorality. That's a sin. It's a terrible thing. But that's... That's not a father who rapes his little girl. What, what, what about the unforgivable? In a room of this size, not because I know you, I don't know you, but in a room this size, there are people in this room against whom unforgivable things have been done. I can, I can state that categorically. I'm not asking anybody to raise your hand. I'm just saying there are. There are people here. Unforgivable things. So... Some of the questions we have is, if I forgive them, what about their debt? Yeah, see, the thing is, when you forgive them, it has nothing to do with them. It heals you. So, holding someone in unforgiveness, someone far cleverer than I said, it's like drinking poison and hoping that it will kill your victim. We release them. Their eternal destiny and their relationship with God, you actually have nothing to do with that. If you hold them in unforgiveness, you can't make them go to hell. And if you forgive them, you can't make them go to heaven. So that's between them and God. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Forgiveness of the unforgivable is a release emotionally and spiritually, but it let me say it straight out. You can forgive the man who raped you as a little girl, and that's forgiveness and that's fine, but you don't have to let him babysit your kids. Now, that, that's a very important thing. Sometimes we talk about forgiveness as if it changes r reality. So you, you forgive the husband who beat you up. Yes, so that you can get healed. Of the violence and the unforgiveness both, that's right. But you don't have to expose you and your children to more violence. That, that's not what forgiveness means. How do you forgive the unforgivable? How can you forgive the unforgivable? I went to preach at a Methodist church in Ohio. And I was preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit great big man came up. It was Methodist church had those communion rails, you know, the wooden. And this great big man came. He was probably 6'6", six, six, 260, six, 70 pounds. He came up to the front and he hit that communion rail. I thought it was coming over. And he was weeping. And so I went over to kneel down beside him. The pastor came. The altar was full of people. And I said, you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? He said, he said, more than anything in the world. I said, what's the problem? He said, there's a, a block. And until it's gone, I, I know I'll never receive. So I said, do you know what it is? He said, oh, I know exactly what it is. He said, I'm the deputy sheriff in this county. I responded to a shooting call at a local bar two years ago. He said, a guy shot a woman at, I see several people nodding heads. I think maybe the story was in the newspaper, so. You, if you were in Ohio and you know this story, he shot a woman at close range with a shotgun and nearly cut her in half. He said, I came in the bar, I disarmed the man, took this gun away, 
put these cuffs on him, and we turned the victim over, and he said, it was my daughter. He said, I, I had to be restrained by the other policeman. He said, I had my service weapon out. He said, I would have shot him right there. And he said, I hate that man so bad that I, it is, it's just poisoned my whole life. He said, I've plotted his death while he was in a local jail. I would go sit on a railroad trestle with a high-powered rifle, and I'd walk him, watch him walk in front of the window, and I could have shot him. He said, I, I can't receive the Holy Spirit with that man in my life, and I don't know how to deal with it. So I had the pastor kneel on the inside of the communion rail, and I said to the man, I want you to imagine that your daughter's murderer is on the other side of this communion rail. This is, the, this is where Jesus invites us to the table of communion. And he says, I want to heal everybody who kneels here. I want to heal you. Take away the debt. Heal you. Forgive you. And he says to you, I will let you decide. Can this man have communion with me, be forgiven, and go to heaven when he dies? I'll let you decide. And I said, if you will lay your hands on your daughter's murderer's head and invite him to the communion table with Christ, I believe God will heal you both. That big sheriff shook like a wind, like a leaf in a wind tunnel. I've, I've never experienced anything like it. His whole body vibrated. Finally, he reached his hands out and laid his hands on the pastor's head, and he said, all right, I forgive you. I forgive you. And the pastor and I laid our hands on him, and regardless of what your theology is about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he was filled wonderfully in a beautiful way with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and witnessed to it in a powerful, powerful way. So this is the old days when revivals went night after night after night. So the next night I came back to preach and that sheriff and his wife weren't there. And I was so angry. I said, I can't believe this. I'm so tired of these spiritual experiences that don't last 24 hours. And the pastor said, now, Dr. Rutland, calm down. They're not here because they've gone to the state pen. To meet with their daughter's murderer. He said, those people were healed. They were healed here last night. Now they've gone to take healing to the state penitentiary. I don't, I don't know everything that Jesus meant in Matthew chapter 6. But if he didn't mean at least that, it doesn't mean anything. If it does mean that, then it's got to mean that somehow we in the nicks and abrasions of daily life can live in somehow the power to forgive and release from hope of payment. In that, there is healing. And, and it's, it's better and sweeter and greater than we think. Well, let me pray. If you'll bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for this precious group gathered here, come out in this storm and to be here to seek your presence and your witness and your grace. Now, I'm going to open my eyes, but I'd like to invite you to keep yours closed if you don't mind. But I just want you to understand I'm opening my eyes. So if you would say, Dr. Rutland, please pray for me. Please pray. I, there is somebody that I just cannot seem to forgive. I can't seem to get there. If that's you, then you can just lift your hand up and take it right back down. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, so many. Yes, yes, ma'am. I see you back there now. Who else? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Look, that doesn't mean something horrible about you. What it means is that you're as human as the rest of us. And you're going to have to get your mind around it. Heavenly Father, I pray for these who have been wounded. 
hurt. Their lives have been walked on. They've been trespassed on. I pray for the healing grace. Flow into them. Course through their body and their mind. Into the very nucleus of their cells. In the bloodstream. In their flesh. In their spirit. In their brain. And neurological system. Receive. God's grace. Now everybody in the room. Just pray with me. Aloud if you don't mind. So that we surround them with our voices. And let's say it together. I forgive. forgive. Not in my strength. strength. But in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. I I forgive. I release from any hope of payment. Relationally, Relationally. financially, Financially. emotionally, Emotionally. I release, release. and I forgive. forgive. Now keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed and listen. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and in the authority of that name, as thou hast forgiven, thou art forgiven. Receive the forgiveness and healing grace of Christ. Flowing into you right now. Flowing right through you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Be forgiven. Be healed. Release. Let go of the rope. The bell may ring for a while. But from this moment on. You're forgiven in a whole new way. Because you have forgiven in a whole new way. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you very much. It's a joy to be here with you. Thank you very much.